Excellent. Hey, man, if you have a Bible with you, open it up to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs is in the Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 3. Um, and we're going to have, I think, uh, hopefully a very helpful conversation today. I brought with me this Bible, and I was, uh, I was reading it this morning, and I couldn't help but just kind of remember where I got this Bible. It has my name on the front right here, and this was given to me by uh, one of the most influential men in my life. In fact, I would say of the top three most influential men in my life, uh, that's who gave me this Bible. It's a friend of mine. His name is Al Kirkstra. And he gave me this quite a long time ago. And uh, Al was, he's retired now, but he was uh, vice president of Zondervan Publishing, which at that time was the world's largest Christian publisher. And his wife, Agnes, was my assistant, my administrative assistant when I was a children's pastor in our church. And the reason I say that Al was uh, so influential in my life is because he's the man that one of a few, but the primary one who discipled me. And he gave me this Bible as a gift. And I want to tell you, not just this particular Bible, but the Bible has changed my life. I wasn't exposed to Scripture until I was about 21 years old. So that was about four years ago. And, <laughs> and uh, I've come to learn over time that this isn't simply a, a theological dictionary. It's not just a moral handbook. It's not even a devotional grab bag where we just kind of open it and, oh, what do we have for us today? But this is the living, active, breathing, inerrant, infallible, trustworthy Word of God. And it will change your life. But be warned, there's some things in here that are kind of crazy. There's some stuff in here that just seems a little backwards. Maybe even a little upside down. But I wonder, who's upside down? Is it or am I? And I sometimes think, well, maybe, maybe you know, since sin and our sin and our brokenness and the fall of humanity, maybe this is one way that God's trying to like right side up our lives by giving us his word so that we know how to live and know the direction that we're to go. But there's still things in here that are kind of, they just feel upside down. They're like, what are you talking about? But it always requires trust when you open up scripture. In fact, if you're in Proverbs 3, you go down to verse 5. You notice how I lay down my paper Bible and I pick up my digital one, right? <laughs> And here's what Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 says to us. I'm using the New International Version, or the NIV is the translation. It says, trust, everybody say that, say trust. If you were to try to synthesize faith, that's a pretty big topic. I would suggest it's the word trust. Faith is trust, and we all have faith in something or someone, regardless of our belief in God or our belief in Jesus, we are all trusting in something, a predictable outcome in the system, in politics, in people, in our anthropology, in our observation of humanity, whatever. We, we trust something or we trust someone. Scripture says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Verse 6 says, in all your ways, everybody say all your ways. We're in this series right now called Apply to All, and we're looking at just some of the basic principles of God's Word that we can apply to every situation of life, every circumstance, every mountaintop, every valley, every relationship, every work environment, every school environment. What are the things that God says that we're to apply to every situation in life? And verse 6 says this, In all your ways, submit to him, 
and he will make your paths straight. Whenever you see in Scripture the, the, the statement like he will, it's, it's a promise from God. But we have to trust in him with all of our heart in all of our ways. And when we do and we submit to him, he makes our paths straight. Now keep in mind, Proverbs is a wisdom literature. That means that if I apply it consistently over a lifetime, this is the outcome I will have. So you'll have bumps and you'll have detours along the way, but if we consistently trust in the Lord with all of our heart and in all of our ways submit to him, he will make our paths straight. I've got a lot of Bibles uh, in our house. There's another translation that I have. It's actually not in print, but it's very alive. And I call it the S-R-A-B translation. It's called the Scott Rogers Application Bible. And here's how I would sometimes write Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, just to be honest with you. Here's the S-R-A-B translation. Trust in the Lord with some of your heart, but lean more on your own understanding. Some of you have already read this before, haven't you? In some of your ways, submit to him, and he owes it to you to make your paths straight. Anybody ever had that version in your heart before? You're like, yeah, I was just reading that yesterday. Like, come on. (laughs) But God says that we got to trust him. And there's going to be a challenge because you and I, just because we're human and we've been brought up to have a framework of thinking, a way that we look at life, a way that we look at the world, and a lot of that is fantastic. But because we're sinful, broken human beings, we're kind of upside down. And God wants to give us his truth to help right side up our lives so that we live a, a life that honors him and that is fruitful and fulfilling. And so today I want to have a conversation about generosity. And immediately some of your heart rate went up. You're like, oh, you're going to start talking about money, Scott. Not really. We're going to talk about the biblical teaching on living a lifestyle of generosity. Because the reality is when generosity, that conversation does include money. But if you look at Scripture, it's not just about money. The reality is, is that I can be generous with or without money. Everybody say, I can be generous. And we can be generous with or without money. Let me show you an example. If you have a Bible, scroll to or turn to the New Testament to the book of Acts. A-C-T-S, the book of Acts, chapter 20. And in chapter 20, Paul the Apostle is writing to the, the elders of the church and kind of the, the apostles and the pastors. And he he's basically lays out this whole journey he's been on that's been full of persecution full of challenges, and he goes on and he says, I have not hesitated to teach you the whole counsel of God's word. And he unpacks all these trials he's had. And as he's going through all this, he's basically saying, here's how I've poured out my life for the mission of God in the world that he's given me to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And in that context, go down to verse 35, because here's what he says. He says in verse 35, towards the second half of the verse, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed. Life is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus promises us that life is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, even if you're a follower of Christ, you're a Christian, that seems upside down, doesn't it? Because, I mean, come on, haven't you been like me? When I think when I'm blessed, I'm like, the Lord has provided. And you say it that way, you say, the Lord has provided. You get a little vibrato in there. Like, the Lord has provided. I have more than enough. And that's true. God's blessing includes his provision in our lives. But Jesus says something here that that makes us go, whoa, what is he talking? He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. 
Do you realize that according to the words of Jesus himself, that the the true blessing, the greater blessing, is in the giving, not the getting? When you give, when I give, Jesus says, you're blessed because you are a giver, not only a getter. Let me give you some examples. So last Sunday, I think it was, um, Rusty and Alicia Burris, they're part of our church. I think they're, they come to the uh, 11 o'clock service, I believe. And they had about almost 40 of our student volunteer leaders that were investing in our students. And if you've ever hosted 40 people in your house, anybody ever done that? Like, raise your hand. You're like, man, I've had like, like just a few of us. I don't think 40 people would fit in my house. In fact, I know they wouldn't. That's a lot of work. Cleaning the house and getting everything ready and going through all the stress of buying the stuff and preparing the environment and organizing everything. And I don't know if they're bringing anything or not, but you got to organize that. And before they get there, like you're fighting with your spouse and you're hating life and you're like, ah, rah, rah, rah. And then the doorbell rings the first time. You're like, praise the Lord. We're so glad you're here. Anybody ever done that? Come on in. Glory to God. It's a beautiful day. And then you look at your spouse on the corner of your eye like, I'm going to kill you when we're done tonight. That's a lot of work. Rusty and Alicia are generous with hospitality. And because of that generosity, all of those people felt encouraged, seen, affirmed, and blessed. And when Rusty and Alicia said goodbye to the last person, probably exhausted, in that exhaustion, if we were to use the words of Jesus, he would say to them, ah, you're blessed. Enjoy the exhaustion. Enjoy the blessed space that I've just put you in. I know Lauren Butler's here. Uh, Lauren, you have helped us build our regen ministry. And I got to see you at the luncheon last week, and you were just sharing how you didn't see yourself as a leader, and you were very hesitant to step into that, and look what God has done. Because of your generous commitment, people are finding freedom through the power of Jesus and the Spirit of God. Your generosity is helping us to be more fully devoted and fruitful followers of Jesus. You're blessed for investing in that way. I was able to stop by uh, um, one of the small groups that a group of men and I have been gathering together as a small group for a couple of years, and, and we branched. That means we kind of started new groups out of our group, and uh, just this last uh, fall in uh, Jeremy Ferguson and Randy Smith are leading one of those new groups, and I was able to stop by because they invited me over for some homemade chili, and I said, well, the Lord hath spoken, and they're in my neighborhood, so it was real easy just to swing down the street, so I go over and just hung out for a little bit, and, uh, and Jeremy and Randy are investing in this small group of men. They're creating a relational environment, and they're intentional in having conversations where these men can be vulnerable trusting one another as they process what life looks like to walk with Jesus. And they're generous in relationships. And it's changing the lives of those men. Some of you are extravagant financial givers at the Met. And your generosity in giving financially is resulting in a lot of what God's doing here. Oh, Scott, you can't say that. It's the Spirit of God that does the work of God. Absolutely. But without the generosity of God's people, we're not even sitting in this room, are we? Without the generosity of God's people, we're not witnessing in two services today, 26 people 
following Jesus in baptism. That's awesome. And your giving helps fuel the mission of the local church. You see, we can be generous with and without money. And Jesus actually makes us the promise that when we are givers, then we are truly blessed. And for all of you who are just giving your life away in the name of Jesus, I want you to listen to these scriptures and let the word of God speak to you because this is God's promise to you. Here's what it says in Proverbs 11. Just listen. You, don't, you can read it later. Proverbs 11, 25, it says, The generous will prosper. Let me just read that again. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. That's a promise from God's word. Prosper in how? Prosper in provision, prosper in strength, prosper in stamina, prosper in grace, pros- prosper in kindness. Toward- it just When you give, God gives back to you. It's just in the word of God. Look at the next verse here in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 6, this is about financial giving, but it's true all throughout the narrative of Scripture. Remember this, Paul the Apostle writes, whoever sows or invests or gives sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. But come on, Scott, you don't know my whole story, I don't. So Scott, I don't have enough to be generous. Can I just say with respect, that's a lie. You and I have more than enough to be generous. We have more than enough to invest in the lives of other people. We have more than enough ability to speak kindness towards those around us. We have more than enough to be loving towards other people. We have more than enough to give of our time to lift someone else in their situation and help them go to their next place in God's calling on their life. We have more than enough to give and to invest in others because generosity is more, isn't about what I don't have, but it's about what I do have. And as you think about God, what do I have that I can be generous with? I guarantee he will start to say, oh, this and that and yeah that right there and that and that and just trust him and start walking in it and living in it and watch what he does because you're already a generous people you're already an incredibly generous church for those of you who were able to be here with us last Sunday it was our celebration and sending out of Pastor Matt and Jennifer and Claire and Chloe as they moved to Oklahoma and Matt's actually teaching at that church, probably right now, right this moment. And it's a great time for that church. And after 13 years of Matt's faithful investment of his time and his gifts and his energy into our lives, myself included, in our church and even in our community, you know what we could have done? We could have been like, hold time out, stop, nope. No, Matt, God created you for me. God's calling on your life is all about my small circle. That ain't God. But you didn't do that at all. You were so celebrative and you gave so much gratitude towards Matt and Jennifer and just loved on them and continue to love on them. And when he comes back to to preach now and then and maybe to lead worship, you're going to love on him like crazy and drive him crazy because of how much we appreciate him and his family. Why? Because you're a generous people. You've got the love and the thankfulness to give. And as you give it, God says, ah, now you're blessed because you're giving generously. God calls you and me to be a generous people. And the people of God are generous. Why? Because God's generous to us. Think about it for just a moment. Scripture says, in the, right, like right after the, the front cover, like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's pretty generous. 
And then it says that after God created all these things and said, it's good, he created you and me in his image and said, oh, that's very good. That's a, that's a generous God. But then as we mess it all up and we rebel and say, God, I'm smarter than you. I'm going to trust in my ways more than yours. Sin comes in and it goes throughout of all humanity and now we're all sinful and we're broken. And God says, yeah, but I'm going to rescue you. And I'm going to redeem you. And I'm going to pursue you all throughout the history of humanity even in your folly and being ridiculous and not trusting in me and stumbling again and again and again, I'm going to continue to pursue you and always hold out the invitation. It's by grace you're saved through faith. Would you receive my salvation? As he becomes one of us on Christmas, that's pretty generous. We can't even relate to divinity becoming humanity because that's a concept that we just, it's intangible to us, but that's generosity. And then to put himself on a cross to receive a brutal, brutal beating. That's generosity. And then he pours out his spirit after he's raised from the dead and he births the church and he puts us on mission and he brings billions throughout history into a saving relationship with him and says, hey, eternity is yours. Your relationship with me is secure. Now live these short days full of purpose and meaning and mission in my name. That's generosity. When you are generous and I am generous, we're being like the one who created us. Imagine if God was stingy and cheap and had a scarcity mentality. What would that mean for you and for me? But he's not. He's incredibly generous. and He's calling you and I to be the same. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for just a moment. Lord, I pray that you would challenge us to be a generous people. God, would you help us to see that you have provided more than enough in several ways for us to be generous. And God, I pray that you'd call us up to a standard of generosity that might even be beyond, be beyond where we are right now. And as we do, God, we thank you that you will provide. You will refresh us. You will provide for us, God. When we so generously. We will reap generously, God. That is not a selfish desire. That's a promise from God's holy word. And with our heads still bowed and our eyes closed, maybe you're here today, maybe you're online, and you've never thought about the generosity of God towards you. And, and maybe you don't believe in Jesus, but yet this conversation it's something God is using to capture your heart and your mind, even if it's just a little. Because the message of Jesus is a generous message. That God created you, but yet sin broke you, but Jesus wants to save you. The generosity of God is extended towards you today. If you don't know Jesus... He wants to introduce himself to you and he wants you to know him and he wants to forgive your sin and he wants to invite you into a meaningful relationship with him so that this life is fruitful and rich and rewarding because of his goodness and so that when you step into eternity, you know that you spend it in his presence. With our heads bowed and maybe your eyes are closed just so that you can listen to the voice of the Spirit. Maybe you'd say today, Scott, I want to accept the generous offer that God gives of forgiveness. Scott, I want to receive Jesus today. I never realized that this was an expression of generosity towards me. Would you receive it today? Maybe you're online and, and God's got your heart right now. I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus. Maybe you're here in this room. And you've never made a conscious decision to say, Jesus, I accept your grace. I accept your forgiveness. I accept your love. I'm all yours. 
But I want to lead you in a prayer to do that this morning. To talk to Him and surrender your life to Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean on your own understanding. But in all your ways, submit to Him. And He'll make your path straight. If you've never asked Christ in your life, I want to invite you to pray this with us. Because we're all going to pray this to support you. Right, church? We're going to surrender a prayer of surrender to Christ. Let's all pray this. Say, Lord Jesus, today I thank you for your generosity. That you've died on the cross for me. And you've risen from the grave to prove you're the Son of God. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. Be the Lord of my life. The Savior of my soul. Help me to trust you, to submit to you. Thank you that you love me and that I'm forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, let's celebrate for anyone and those who may have made that decision. Congratulations. Here's what I want you to do. Stand up with me. Everybody just stand up for this moment. I'm going to dismiss you. But before you go, if you just made that decision, and you're here with somebody you know, I guarantee it, I guarantee it, they would love to know that you made that decision. Share it with them and tell them. That'll be a great conversation. If this is your first time here and you're in the room, as you exit out to your right, there's a place that says, new here, start here. Those folks would love to say hi to you. They have a gift for you. Love to have you come back sometime here at the Met, especially on Christmas Eve. Um, You guys are awesome. Love you. Next Sunday, Pastor Christian Miller is going to be talking. And uh, how many of you guys know Christian? He's amazing. You're going to love him. He's smarter and nicer than I am. So if I broke it, come back. He'll fix it. You guys, we'll see you next week. All right? Have a good one.